And as wild as this main event finish was, it had to be helped by the momentum from that wild ass co main. <laughs> I don't, like, there's just not ways to describe what the hell we watch. (laughs) Luke Rockhold, who's now retired, the former middleweight champion, went out in a blaze of glory against Paulo Costa that I can only compare to, like, Kevin Costner's character in the 90s movie Tin Cup, where it's like, no, he didn't win, but he won. He won in many different ways. Rockhold, always respected in the skill set, but people love to hate this guy, right? For a lot of reasons. He comes out of here... I mean, just beloved for the insane amount of heart, blood, sweat, and tears he showed. Rashad, I have never seen a fighter that exhausted after a single round. In round two, he's bending over in the middle of the fight with his hands on his knees. And to see somebody so dangerously, desperately, and recklessly dialing up loaded strikes and then landing them in particularly round three, which is among the most batshit five minutes of theater you could ever cook up for elite-level MMA. Costa takes home the decision. It was deserved, but this was almost the the wackiest ending we ever could have cooked up until the main event of Usman <laughs> Edwards 2. Uh, when you look at this, even though he lost, Rockhold kind of wins this, right, Rashad? It, it, this is going out, I don't want to say on top, but all we're talking about now is the balls of Luke Rockhold. I didn't think he had it in him, Rashad. I really didn't. You know, when Luke Rockhold came out, he came out to a song, Immortal Technique, The Point of No Return. And that song stuck out to me because that's the same song I came out to when I fought Chuck Liddell. So I knew what his mindset was when he came out. I knew he was on the mindset of he's, he, he burned the boats. And I'm not sure if everybody knows what burning the boats mean or what it kind of yeah. alludes to, but you know, there there is this army general, and he brought his uh, his 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 people. They came in boats, and they were gonna uh, go to war. And when they got there, they learned that they were outnumbered. So when they were sleeping, they got up. They were all sleeping on shore, and the army captain had someone burn all the boats, so there was no going back. So they had to fight. Yeah, that's so, from Art of... I looked it up real quick. It's from Art of War with, with uh, Sun Tzu. Yes, yes. So he burned the boats. And, and sometimes you got to burn the boats because there is no going back. There is no going back. Your life is forever going to be changed after this moment. And for him to go out there and, and to say, you know what? No matter what happens, I'm going out on my shield. It, it takes... It takes a lot of balls because a lot of times when you're out of there, when you're out there and you have that intent and you get in your face beat in, you start thinking like, yeah, you know what? Let me just stop because I'm going to quit and retire anyways. But I knew at weigh in when I talked to Luke Rockhold, he was just burning up like he was just he was super geeked, almost as if like he was just on something. But that was just him riding at adrenaline. Like if you've seen him at the weigh-ins, like he was pacing back and forth. He was like salivating at the mouth and he was talking in tongues like I'm going to kill this dude. You know, so you knew that something was different about Luke. But I kind of felt like something was different about Luke going into this fight all along, just listening to his interviews like he was just raw the whole week. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he was t- slinging trash talk at Costa, even to levels where it was like abrasive, you know, and, and yeah. fighter pay, honest sort of download that he did that had Dana against him. My favorite part of this fight in many ways, and we'll get into have you seen the shit shortly, we'll be able to look at some of these crazy moments. But Dana's post fight press conference after when he was like, look, we had our ups and downs this week, but. I'm never going to say another bad word again about Luke Rockhold after this. It was almost like Dana giving him carte blanche for the rest of his life because that's, you know, that's the quickest way to Dana's heart, this type of nomadic, barbaric performance. But what Dana said in particular, he was like, people like us, and this is Dana finally aligning himself with the scumbag MMA media and saying, we have no idea what those two men had to do to make that fight happen and to finish that fight. Rashad, I, again, I've never seen a fighter as exhausted after one round who went on to have moments in the fight like Rockhold did. How would you describe how deep he actually did dig within himself to pour that out? Because he's known for, in the second half of his career, great fighter, but if you clock him clean, the fight's going to be over. And this went past stamina, iron will. 
I mean, he was dealing with. I mean, he was he was taking one of those scoopers inside the protein pack and just going deep. It, Rashad, hold on. I don't even know if this is legal. I mean, just going deep and pouring that shit out on top of Costa. I mean, d- dude, like that's like they got me pinned down. My family's about to die, and I, the only way I can I can get there is by get you know is by crawling on my stomach after the plane crash to get to the. I mean, this is some of the most insane, manly, courageous shit I've ever seen. I didn't think it was physically possible, Rashad. How did he do that? You know what? I, I didn't either, especially Luke. You know, Luke is kind of a pretty boy. And, uh, you know, knowing Luke outside of fighting, you wouldn't think that, you know, the balls that he had, he would just go out there and, and, and fight like that. But, you know, it, it was truly um, him saying goodbye to the sport. And he was trying to say the goodbye to the sport on his terms. So... He was willing there to go in there and, and, and fight to 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 death until he had really nothing left to give. And I mean, I I, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, he, he was, you know, kind of suicidal. But at the same time, his mindset was going to the place where it's like, you know what, I don't care how I come out after this. And when you go that deep, you have to not care. You have yeah. to not care, you know, if if you're going to have a scar that, you know, that stays on your face for the rest of your night at this, at that moment, you're living in a moment so much that nothing exists outside of that moment. And you can tell Luke was in that presence of mind where nothing exists outside of that moment, because even when, you know, he was down and out and getting his butt kicked, he had throw an overhand right and be like, what, what? And, and just, and like hearing him just like talk shit the whole time and, and, and getting pounded was just like, this dude, like, if you're Costa, you gotta be like, dude, what do I gotta do to get you out of here? Because he just, he just kept hanging on. It's, it's, it's incredible, and I'm glad he was able to give that moment. Forget us, in our entertainment level, or forget Dana White for himself, because he's had injuries, he's had doubt. I mean, didn't he almost have leg amputation? I mean, he's had like some, some shit. And he's had also spectacular losses in moments where we thought he might be back and, and try and afford something. So to see him have that moment, but then to retire on his own terms and just be like, fuck, I'm too old for this. I mean, we all can relate to that. It was great. It was great. Oh, my God. I mean, and then, like, he's not known for that. So you you can't overemphasize how dangerous that third round could have been for him, not just, you know, the, how close he was to pure exhaustion, but when you're fighting that recklessly, you could just get caught with the type of... I mean, you can just get caught with the type that you don't recover. Like, you know, you don't, you don't mentally, physically yeah. recover from. He got through it. So when we flip the script to Paulo Costa, who, again, it was the oddest 30 to 27 across the board fight you ever saw. Do we take anything away from Costa and how much he was getting lit up with those, you know, wounded animal strikes from Rockhold? Or was it so batshit crazy that, you know, survive by any means necessary? No, I don't take anything away from Costa for that because it was a fight. And and, and by that, I mean this, like when you fight versus, you know, uh, versus, you know, how it typically plays out, like in a fight, you fight with more emotion. You know, when, when you're when you're not fighting, you you it's more of a technical aspect of it, you know, and you and you and it's all about the X's and O's. But when you're fighting, it's like I'm going to throw a hit and you hit me with that shot. And that shot hurt and it pissed me off. And without even trying to be calculated, I'm just going to hurl something back. We fighting right there. You know, almost technique goes out of the window when it's a fight. And that's where that's where the vulnerability comes in. That's where you can take a fighter who's a better fighter and make him a less of a fighter because he's fighting with that emotion. And I've seen Casa fight with that emotion. And, and that's a that's a dangerous place to fight from because that's where you get exhausted. That's where you are less calculated. And that's where you can get caught. But fighting at that emotional level it, it, it really makes fans like drawn to you because they can see the heart that you're putting into it and you kind of bear your soul when you put your when you just go out there and you fight like that and look to be very fair there are a lot of people who believe that that art form of of the emotional fight is lost at the highest professional level in mma today and you hear like you don't hear it as much because the ufc has gotten to such a level that it's so mainstream that there's so much attention on it. But Luke Thomas always says it right. I mean, there are like that generation of hardcore fans in the mid to late early, you know, 2000, the aughts, 2005 to 2010, that run. A lot of those fans are no longer MMA fans and they were as diehard as ever back then. And I think when you go back and watch those fights, those fights, even though you're seeing the evolution of skill in, in front of your eyes, they're still fights. 
Even right. the guys who are the skilled technicians still have to fight through this emotional barrage of craziness that has been homogenized now that everyone is a complete well-rounded mixed martial artist and you know everyone's technical that when we get Nate Landwehr against Oma Onama in that wild third round when we get moments like this it is a reminder of uh, for a lot of us especially us older fans the reason why we got into this in the first place and it's not just you know a lust for violence or a love for for combat dis style versus combat style it's that what I'm seeing on the screen reminds me of like fights I've seen in the schoolyard or in the bar. You know what I mean? Like that, that whole type yeah. of just like emotion coming in. This had that. Some of Paulo Costa's biggest fights have had that. But do you believe Costa's fully back? Meaning the, the same fighter who, who, who built that road to the title opportunity against Adesanya. Yeah, he's still going to be wild and he's an offensive force. But I think this week I saw him get back in the shape he needed. And even mentally, Rashad, he was taking all the things people say bad about him and making jokes about it. He had the bottle of the secret sauce and secret juice, whatever it was. Like, I saw a different Costa, and I kind of liked it. Do you think that's good enough to put him back now into this title mix and believe he can make another run? I believe so, you know, because he fought with that emotion. And when you fight with that emotion, it makes you tired. And Costa's biggest thing and one of my biggest knock on Costa was the fact that he gasses and you can gas him out. And all you have to do is weather the early storm. But then you have the, a different Costa the second and third round. But, uh, you know, he, he shattered that. You know, I think that he he fought really well. He, you know, he fought, you know, economically when he needs to at times. He sprinted when he needs to at times. But either whether he was sprinting or he was fighting economically, he wasn't overly gassed afterwards. And, you know, my favorite moment was, was after the fight was over and he was doing an interview and he made a comment. And then and then he had a, he said a phrase and then the, the crowd said the phrase back to him. And in that in that moment, it showed me that the fans get him. And, and he's figured it out on a fan level. He's figured out how to market himself. He's figured out how to be that heel, but also walk that line where he's also a fan favorite as well, too, because it's one thing to be a, a heel and just be completely you know, despised and hated by everybody and no one cheers for you, but it's another thing to be that heel that people love. And that's what Casa definitely is right now. I would agree with that. And, and you know, as long as he's making weight and he's physically and, and mentally healthy, He's always going to be a bit of a wild card because he does swing big, and sometimes his defense can get lapsy. But I did see enough to know he's still at least going to be a force, maybe not as much as I thought he was going to be caveman from here on out. But I think, uh, you know, I think there is a, a, a sly fox under there, and, and this was a comeback fight to some degree to snap the losing skid.